Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the fourth uh, entry of the Wall Crawler cast. Uh, today I'm joined by Gavin, who you might know as Spidey Central on Instagram. Uh, so yeah, he's going to join with me. Yeah, today. what's up guys? Yeah, we're going to talk about the first Spider-Man uh, film. with Second Toby. best Spider-Man movie. The what? Second best Spider-Man movie. I would agree. Yeah. Right behind Spider Man uh, 2. I think we're going to talk about the first, uh, just the three films, and then we'll start delving into other topics. But uh, we're going to have like one episode for each movie and yeah. uh, going to go in depth on all those. Also, and we'll have um unpopular comic fan coming in uh, next yeah. episode. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, he's, uh, he's awesome. So, uh, yeah, just go ahead and tell them about like yourself, Gavin, and how you got into Spider-Man. All right. Well, um, when I was little, I was about two or three. My mom was going through the channels on TV, and before that, I had no interest in Spider-Man at all. I was into like you know dinosaurs and sharks, just typical kid stuff. And then she's going through the channels, and then we see Spider-Man on TV by Sam Raimi. And I do you remember, remember which movie it was? Yes, the, the first one. Okay. So that, you know, I was just immediately attached to it. I don't know what it was. I was only three. I couldn't really process anything that was happening. But I, just the bright colors and seeing Spider-Man, um, the way Sam Raimi brought him to life and made him heroic and how it just stands out to little kids. That's why uh, his movies are so loved nowadays because people grow up, grew up with them. And basically, yeah, this movie really introduced me to Spider-Man and everything about his character and everything I love about him. And from three years old on, I was just everything Spider-Man. I was obsessed with him my whole life. Um, and Spider-Man was really there for me when I needed him, even though it's just a fictional character. Uh, whenever I was going through tough times, I just turned to Spider-Man and it felt like everything was all right. So, you know. Yeah, I have a very similar uh, introduction to the character. I'm not sure what it was, but... You know, my dad was a big comics guy in the 90s, and Spidey was the main guy he collected. So yeah, he kind of took it upon himself to, like, raise me in the ways of Spider-Man. <laughs> yes. So I I wore Spider-Man pajamas. I had Spider-Man sheets. Like, oh, no, yeah. it was my choice. He's like, yes, <laughs> giving my two-year-old son all the Spider-Man stuff. So I've always loved him. Yeah. So I don't know if there's ever been a time where I... There hasn't been a time where I've not had the character around me in some way so yeah there was a small time when like in middle school because i read the comics back in elementary school and but it was mostly like more modern stuff and then when i got to middle school i kind of dropped the comics a little bit got into the flash so i had a small time away from spider-man and then around ninth grade late ninth grade i started reading the comics again but i got more into you know 70s 80s and then that's where my love for the character just completely reignited. Nice. Uh, I didn't read the comics until middle school, I think. Like, oh, my dad would read me some, like, as bedtime stories sometimes, but I never, yeah. like, got into comics till later. Yeah. I think I was, like, 12 or something. <laughs> now here so, we are. Yeah. Uh, it's been kind of crazy. And, yeah, I had a s similar sort of thing. Like, Spider-Man didn't necessarily, necessarily go away. But I kind of like got more into like other Star characters, Wars. yeah, and yeah. other characters, that sort of thing. Yeah, same for me. Like Spider Man didn't completely disappear. You know, he's always been a part of me. It's just you know the comics kind of drifted away over time, and yeah. he's always been there. But you know, around the time Homecoming released, I wasn't into the comics that much, and then you know I was all over that movie when it came out. So yeah, I'd always been into the character, but nothing. It was. It wasn't until Civil War that I went like, hundred percent. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's what. Yeah. Kind of like how the Force Awakens put me into Star Wars. Same Civil here. Is what uh, reignited Spider-Man for me. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, yeah, let's go and uh, start talking about the movie. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna talk about just like the characters at first. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about is, of course, Spider-Man, Peter Parker. Um, yeah, how he compares to the comics and just how he is as a character. Yeah, just the, like how he's portrayed. Uh, 
So what are your general thoughts about uh, Peter in this movie? I think he's probably, he's probably the cl- one of the closest interpretations to Spider-Man we've ever seen um, as an adaptation because the, you know, the themes of the comics are very well captured and I can't figure out a long, a lot wrong with Peter himself. I mean, obviously there's a small lack of quips, but that's, that's something we'll get into later. But, you know, Peter, he's, he's, you know, he believes he owes the world nothing initially. That's why he lets the criminal go. He got screwed over by the guy trying to um, give him cash at the wrestling arena. And he lets the guy go. He's irresponsible, doesn't care what the world wants. Or he doesn't, he doesn't feel like he owes the world anything. And then Uncle Ben dies because of him. And then he learns with great power comes great responsibility right there. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, that's right just like the comics, you know. Yeah, especially like them adapting Amazing Fantasy 15. Yeah. It's just spot on. Like the f- whole first half of the movie, it's just like them doing the origin. And yeah. it's so well done. It's the, it's the <laughs> most impactful origin retelling. For sure. I mean, it I've is heard, hard to you know, adaptations. You know, people are like, man, the origin story is so like overdone. But it's, there's a reason it's so overdone because it's, yeah, it's, it's good... one of the most, you know, it's one of the most iconic origin stories of all time. Yeah, and... I, I'd say it's the best origin story of all time. There's yeah. nothing that comes close. Like, yeah, I don't, I honestly don't mind if uh, they t- retell the origin story again and again because I've, I've read it over and over. I can't tell you how many times I've read it. Yeah, Fantasy Fifty. And there's also a lot of different ways to do it while still staying close to the source material, like. You can have Peter celebrity for multiple months or something, have him like a, a guest star on a TV show or running a TV show. There, there's just a lot of different ways to do it. Yeah, exactly. That's. And I feel like it's like untapped potential that that it hasn't fully been explored yet. But this movie did a fantastic job with it. I'm not. Gonna yeah, I mean, right. even Amazing Fantasy 15 takes place over a couple months. Like, yeah. it's definitely over time they've expanded upon it, but it's definitely it does not mm-hmm. take place over a couple days. Um, yeah. So I mean, I'd, I'd love to see a Spider-Man origin kind of go over a few months and show his progression into a, this, like the celebrity life and becoming more selfish and irresponsible because the money's getting to his head and stuff like that. I mean, I'd love to see an origin done like that. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, just the way that they uh, capture. I mean, again, they kind of change things a little bit, but it's not for the worse or anything. Right. Uh, you know, kind of like necessary changes, not like it's not changes that disrespect the character. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what this movie does. It it changes things uh to like push forward the certain narrative they're trying to tell. Right. And there's not anything that is like necessarily against what the characters are. Yeah. It's like you it know, it's contradict the source material. Or anything yeah, like it's all superficial stuff. Like, you know, Uncle Ben dying at the library instead of at home. I mean, that doesn't yeah. really matter in the long run. But other than maybe Aunt May seeing Uncle Ben die, but I mean, even then, it's kind of either way, it's still traumatic, so it doesn't right. really change much. It's so, like it's like changing Robin's like under underwear from his original suit. Like you can make them pants and it's it's still fine. It's just a superficial change. Yeah. Like he doesn't and need it, the trunks. Yeah, and back to Aunt May, like that thing. If honestly, it's better the way they did it in the movie. If you think about it, because seeing P- uh, having Peter see Uncle Ben die just makes it that much more impactful. Like exactly. I'm like he just shows up at home and he's dead. But like mm-hmm. him actually seeing Ben die in his arms is. Is a lot more powerful, I think. Yeah. And so I think that's a necessary. That's a that's a fine change. Mm-hmm. Of, I mean, anime is still going to be very sad about it no matter what. But yeah, I think that's a really good change in my opinion. That whole sequence of Peter going from seeing Uncle Ben dying to switching into his suit, chasing down the killer at the warehouse is just fantastic. Yeah, the transition from him going from Ben's body to the the. Uh, the wall, you know, he's like taking yeah. up, uh, the costume. 
taking off his clothes for the costume. Like that whole like little run running scene. Yeah, I love that, how that shot. It just gets your uh blood pumping. It's great. Also, you got Danny Elfman's score. You can't Oh dude. That. Yeah. Honestly, it's the best. I don't know if there'll ever be a Spider-Man score that could come close to it. Oh, I doubt it. The, the, I think the closest that's come to it is uh James Horner from Amazing Spider-Man. Um, yeah. That score definitely nailed Peter Parker, but I don't think it's as good as Elfman's. Even like Spider-Man 3 is as good as Elfman's. Oh, it's yeah, not Christopher like, Young. I remember who it was. Uh, but his uh, integration of like the Sandman and uh, Symbiote uh, scores were really good. Yeah, I it's loved uh, the Sandman theme. so good and such like a seamless transition that you don't even realize it's a different composer. I know. No yeah, one even yeah, knows who he is. Young they is just really call, good. yeah. Everyone just calls it Elfman's score because <laughs> no one knows it's another guy. Yeah, I wish more movies nowadays would do that. Me like, too. It seems like all of like the modern superhero movies, like the MCU, like they all have different composers, so they all want to do their own thing. So you I don't have, like that's continuity why, for the music. Yeah, that's why you've got like six or seven different Iron Man theme songs, which. That's a little disappointing because thinking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and how it's all connected and stuff, the hearing their character themes and having definitive theme songs for each character and playing whenever they're on screen would have been really uh, like rewarding. Yeah. They did that. But really, the is. only one that everyone knows is Avengers. Yeah, and that's only disappointing kept because using. You know, I love the first Iron Man theme. I love the Captain America theme from First Avenger. Oh, dude, that first Captain America soundtrack is golden. Yeah, it's, it's like, attached to the character. That's what the character is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really glad that returned for Endgame. Yeah, me too. Towards the end when he uh, gives up the shield to Sam. Yeah. Black Panther's really good. pretty good. Yeah, the Black Panther soundtrack. Didn't that win an Oscar? I think so. Yeah. I'm pretty that surprised sure it did. me, but I mean, it's it was a good, it was it was solid. So I personally uh, preferred the Spider Verse soundtrack, but um, Black. Panther I agree. Was good. Yeah, wasn't it Daniel Pemberton that did that? Yeah, yeah. That soundtrack is really good. Like, really it reminds good. me a lot of the the Ultimate Spider Man game soundtrack. Yeah, and That's then it of, reminded me of uh, just going back to the Raimi movies. They used Uncle Ben's right. line. In the in Spider Verse was pretty cool. Oh yeah, that was pretty cool. Okay, so so yeah, they nailed the origin with Peter, and then he, uh, yeah, just oh, uh, they nailed it. Um, yeah, they they got how he's the everyman trying to do what's right and having to give up what you want. You you know give up your selfish desires for for the greater good. Yes, the final scene with. Uh, MJ is just like I know Spider-Man storytelling. Exactly, and I'll get into that for sure eventually. Yeah, um, even like the uh, you know, just like his uh, parallels and like his uh, dynamic with the Green Goblin is so good. I know that's they did that really well from the comics. How they brought the yeah. rivalry between Spider Man and Goblin to the big screen. Like I how liked, um, the Green Goblin's like motive. Like it's almost it's like he knows he's bad, but he's just yeah. trying to like it's kinda like Darth Sidious in a way. He's yeah. like join me, you know. That's the something like from the comics how Goblin kinda knows he's good. Like his his motive in the comics originally is to go after Spider Man. And then defeat him so he can prove himself to like the criminal underworld. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they changed that, and it's fine that they changed it because, I mean, it's kind of hard to to do that correctly, without it being a little bit generic. So, I like how in the movie, you you have Goblin going. Originally, he like makes the suit, takes the formula, and then he gets revenge for on his company. But during that time, he develops an obsession with Spider Man. So you get to that point that the comics gets to eventually, but just the Kickstarter for his motive is different. Yeah, the uh, his original motive is kind of uh, cliche in the comics. Yeah, so I mean that's a fine. Just because thing. his 
yeah, since then it's been done so much. I know. Uh, just from and it's know. fine that it was done back then because you know that that's when it was still kind of an original motive but yeah yeah nowadays exactly it's been overdone a little bit so it's become cliche but... yeah a lot of things in the early stuff is like <laughs> it's fine for the time but if you yeah. did nowadays like exactly the same way is uh it would be a bit weird that's why they're the comics are so special because they're they're products of their time yeah and, and that's, that's why I appreciate I mean, them so much. It's just another reason why adaptations are good. Because uh, yeah. they make, you know, good changes. That's why comic accuracy to me matters. Is because you you bring that medium from back then, the products of their time, and you translate it to modern day for, for new people to experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so, Peter, I mean, I I don't really have any problems with Peter in this movie, really. I don't uh, think I do either. Um, Toby I guess did a great. Yeah. My one nitpick is it's not even a nitpick. It's just like a preference. Is how in the comics he lets the criminal go because just out of his own will because he's angry at the world, not because he got screwed over or anything. But in the movie, it's because he has he was you know he was screwed over by the the wrestler, um, arena guy. But that's just a preference. I just like in the comics how he's more a little bit more bitter at the world. Yeah. But it's it doesn't fine. Have an emotional, uh, you know, in the moment decision he made. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, either way works for me. Yeah, it still gets the point across really well. So, um, so I mean, Toby did yeah, a great Toby, job. Toby is uh, portraying. normally criticized for his performance, yeah. but I I love what what he did with the character. I honestly don't get the criticism really. Uh, you know, there's the thing like, oh, he's too old. I mean, to yeah, be in high school. No, well, yeah. I mean, if you look at his age, yeah, I guess he is. But does he really look like a 26 year old? No. It's not even. That's not even the point. That like, that's not even why the criticism doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's how Raimi really wanted to get to the college stuff with Peter because that's his favorite era of comics, and it's mine too. And yeah, me too. He didn't want to stick in high school too long. I mean, look at the comics. He's in the He's in high school for about 30 issues. He's yeah, exactly. Like it's it's great because in the movie he's only in the he's in high school for like the first 40 minutes. Yeah. And then he's in high and then it like time jumps and he's in college. So oh, one thing about this movie that you don't realize is that it time jumps all over the place. I know. You do not like, realize where it. do you start? Because I know you start somewhere and you end up at Thanksgiving, but it starts oh, way okay. earlier than that. It starts, uh, I would say, in the spring. Um, oh wow! So it jumps over like a whole summer. It's yeah. Uh, it, honestly, it skips the whole summer. I think. Wow. Um, yeah, just a little timeline. Uh, I didn't thing. even think of that. Uh, so, it starts. I would say it starts in like March or somewhere around there, yeah. and the then over time it goes into. Uh, um, he graduates in June, and then after graduation, uh, he's kind of like already in college almost. Yeah, it kind of just jumps a little bit. I'm not, I, I, I don't remember the exact scenes or whatever, but yeah, he's living with Harry and everything. Um, so, and then of course the Thanksgiving meal. So. It, the climax of the movie is in uh, November, yeah, late November. November. And then um, after the Thanksgiving uh, scene, you could say that it, a couple days have passed from when uh, from when that thing happens to where... Yeah, the whole thing with Norman. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure at least one day passes from that. So yeah. you could say that it's either late. The movie ends in uh, late, early December because Norman dies, and then they have to have his funeral. So it's like a week. Yeah. Later. So the movie ends in early December, which is kind of cool to think about. I like how Raimi did that because I think a part of it is he wanted to stay true to the comics timeline. Because a lot you didn't. I don't think a lot of people realize how close the timeline is accurate to. Yeah, like in the uh, Lee Ditko issues, they—it's almost like every issue took place 
kind of like in the same, you know, each each month a new issue. Yeah. It's almost like that's how it happened in the timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, Green, Green Goblin's Last Stand take place sometime in like early winter. Because I remember Peter was sick. He had like a cold or flu or something like that. Yeah, I think so. Um, that was one reason he was weak. And yeah. Long. Uh, so the movie uh, ends in early December, and that's really cool. Yeah, like the like his high school stuff. Like he he gets the, the spider bin when he's when he's in he's out of high school in thirty issues. So it's like every month passes b- between each issue, mm-hmm. which is cool to think about. Yeah. So it's like you know the the storytelling is so good that you don't even realize that the time. Yeah, is- I was about to bring that up. Like, the story arc is so, like... It flows really well. Yeah, the narrative flows so well that you don't even realize it, that there's a time jump. Yeah. Like, all these movies nowadays, like, they have to tell you when the time jumps. I know, like, five years later. Yeah, it's that's kind not of... Even, that's not even a shot, I swear. It's not even a shot at Endgame. I'm just making a joke. That's it. I know, yeah. Like, it's kind of weird how that happens now. I know. Like... Realizing that this first Spider-Man movie takes place over like a whole year is like you have to think about it. <laughs> I know. I never realized that until like a couple weeks ago. How how long it takes over? Yeah. So yeah, Peter, I think was done really well. Um, yeah. So sure. let's talk about Mary Jane. Okay. Uh, Mary Jane um, was definitely done the best in this movie out of the three Raimi movies. I agree. Uh, this this film compared to the other ones definitely captured her character a lot better. Mm-hmm. I mean, films were fine. Uh, Spider Man Three is kind of iffy, but Spider Man Two she is fine. Uh, but this movie, I think, just nailed her character. A hundred percent, because you know it's just like the the comics how she's a party girl. She or she's not even. We don't really see her partying, but I assume that she is because she of how popular she is. I mean, when she leaves with Flash in his new yeah. car, probably goes to a party or something. Yeah, so we see that she's popular from that, and she has a yeah. lot of friends, and Flash is trying to date her and all this stuff. So Mary Jane is really covered by a facade. She doesn't want people to know who she is on the inside, her insecurities, her passions, her dreams. And we see that with in the backyard. Uh, I think High Top pointed it out, how she's kind of ashamed to tell Peter that she wants to go into acting and then Peter's like, Oh, that's perfect. And then all of a sudden she feels kind of um, settled or kind of at home. Yeah. At home because Peter, yeah. Peter makes her feel, she even tells him later on how Peter makes her feel more than she, herself or something like that. Uh, yeah. More than she could ever be. And she's just me. Yeah. yeah uh, exactly. So, you know the the main thing about MJ is that she she's this very damaged person with her uh, family background. Yes. And I, I'm speaking about the comics right now, but as I'm saying this, you'll realize, dang, the movie really loved <laughs> it. She's a really damaged person by her family background. Her dad is the main problem, and uh, so she she escapes her her family life by, you know, going to school uh, and putting on this mask of being a party person and how nothing could ever be wrong. And she even convinces herself that nothing can be wrong when she's wearing that mask. She even like fools herself. Yeah. So, and she doesn't want anything to do with like any sort of uh, real relationships or real connections to people. She just mm-hmm. kind of, to just you know play along you know try to be as unattached as possible yeah but what she does realize is that what she wants is to open up to someone and peter's the person that makes her realize that exactly oh. and also in the comics like gwen's death kind of kickstarts that because uh she's still the party girl who takes nothing seriously and then gwen's death really shows her that that life needs to be taken seriously sometimes yeah. And even like even though Peter and MJ talk and she kind of opens up and while they're still in high school and then she goes off to 
you know, it's like a per. Yeah. And all right, you just cut uh, off a little bit. Oh, I did. Yeah, you did for like oh. five years. Like, yeah, I don't know. But it's oh, awesome, okay. So. Uh, so she goes right back to her party girl facade, yeah. like is immediately when Flash comes, and then, um, she even through uh, after high school she keeps that facade going with Harry, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah, and, and it and isn't until. Are you going to talk about the hospital scene? Oh, no. I was going to just... Uh, no, no. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that hospital scene is really the turning point for her character. Yeah. Where she's like, oh, dang, Peter Parker's the person that actually makes me feel like More myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, at the end... She, she tells Peter and stuff, but you know, that, that whole arc for the character is just really well done. Yeah, for sure. And I think her progression, uh, is also a reason why, uh, she's more like chilled and mellowed throughout the trilogy. Yeah. She's not as much of a party person after that mm -hmm. because of the development she goes through. So, you know, this movie nailed it. But yeah, I mean, I still think MJ goes. It can be. I mean, I think MJ could be like a spectacular Spider Man really got MJ down to a T. It did, yeah. That's probably <laughs> the MJ. That show that not get down to a T is the real question. I know. Like, the, I feel like my only criticism with that is uh, Venom, but I get into that some other podcast. Yeah, I can talk. I can defend Venom, though. Uh, <laughs> we'll have a debate talked about about, we've talked about this before <laughs> yeah. so uh, MJ's, MJ. yeah MJ was nailed um, let's talk about Norman Osborn for a little bit okay so I think again there wasn't much this movie did wrong as far as like capturing the essence of all these characters mm -hmm. um, I can't there's not really much wrong with it it's like um, Perfect, like Spider-Man <laughs> off story. It's, it's really like a classic Spider-Man story. Like when you think of a Spider-Man story, this is what you want to think of. Yeah, you so got the Norm origin, Green Goblin, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, Norman Osborn. Even though, like you said, it, the start of it's a little different. It, the The core of the character is still there, where he's like, you know, uh, he's just a psycho. The way that Ron Friend says it. Um, I think Tom DeFalco. Ron Friends was talking about Tom DeFalco. They worked on Amazing yeah. Spider in the 80s. Um, maybe it was Roger Stern. I can't remember. But Ron Friends is like, the way he described Norman Osborn is he's crazier than a soup sandwich. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's basically the character. And he yeah. just destroy Spider Man. You really see that in the early comics. Yeah. Like, Willem Dafoe is so freaking good in this role. Like, yeah, he's perfect for it. He is just insane. It is crazy. Like, even just his portrayal. Like, yeah, and just like going ballistic. People like to call it inaccurate to the comics because of the suit, but honestly, the suit does not matter to me. The suit does not matter. It's just like a you know, like the character. Let's think about it. He's a he's a power hungry businessman. He's just trying to grow. He's trying to like grow his business. Um, yeah. He's trying to come up with a groundbreaking formula, the the Oz formula, so he can put his company on top. And he's fired from his own company. And, you know, all he wants is power in this movie, just like the the comics. He just wants more power, more power, more power. Honestly, yeah, that's what drives Norman Osborn is just more power. Yeah. Like Spider Man whole... tries to take that power, so he's like, okay, let's ruin this man's life. <laughs> and I have power, so I'll do that. Yeah, like, let's look at the comics. Basically, um, originally, because you're reading, a, I was reading Amazing Spider-Man 39 or 40 the other day, and basically Norman was initially pretty there, you know, he was there for Harry most of the time. Um, and then 
there's one night where Harry needs help with his homework or something, and Harry uh, Norman blows him off, takes the formula, the formula blows up in his face, and then from there is where he starts neglecting Harry. He adopts the goblin persona, and then his whole goal is to go after Spider-Man so he can prove himself to the criminal underworld, get power around there, and keep building his empire. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, you know, he battles Spider-Man so many times, he develops an obsession with him. Uh, And that's where their rivalry really gets special is when Norm is, you know, obsessed with Spider-Man. Yeah, honestly, just like the reason he just keeps going after Spider-Man is because Spider-Man just keeps getting in his way. Yeah. Okay, I'll get in your way. So, <laughs> yeah, and then you know, we look at the it's the same thing. Was... Like he fights him at the, he fights him at the festival, World festival or whatever. And uh, <laughs> oh, don't you just love uh, what's her name, Macy Gray? <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh man, that that was such a two thousand song. I know. Like that whole scene is really two thousand. Yeah, I loved her little outfit. Like it was, yeah. what was that? It almost looked like pajamas. I know. <laughs> Fashion. But you know, yeah, the carnival scene is. It's like they changed it from the comics, but they got the core of it, which is what matters. Yeah, again, like it's just there's a lot of th- little things they change, but I mean, yeah. the core of the character. And there. Think about it. If if something was a one for one adaptation, it would probably suck. Yeah, I mean, it would. Yes, it would. Because Stan- I don't think anyone wants. If you read Stanley's dialogue. It is very clunky. Yeah, like the new Lion King movie is a one-for-one one adaptation of the original movie. Like, what's the point of it? Yeah, for real. It's like, it's the exact same thing, but worse. Yeah. And I don't think anyone wants to see that. We want to see the comics, uh, brought to life, but you know they're translated to a different medium yeah you're translating it from pages to screen sometimes the translation can't be one for one because that would just be boring and uninspired so yeah, exactly you got to make changes to fit what the what you're trying to tell for the story yeah exactly so yeah norman osborne was uh i really liked the uh you know the choice he had for peter it's almost like the Palpatine choice. It's like, yeah. join me. Or no, 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 Vader talking to Luke. Yeah, it's like, join the dark side. Yeah, and it's kind of a tempting offer, but it's like, no. Yeah, and also that really ties into Peter's arc, which um, after we talk about Harry, I'll start talking about that. Okay. The whole, the whole thing at the climax. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and start talking about Harry then. Okay. Uh, Harry, honestly, he's also done perfectly with how he's seeking his father's approval the whole time. Like, the whole, like even in the, the, the first scene, we're shown how Norman values Peter over Harry and how he looks over Harry's talents and what Harry wants. And he's just kind of, Norman's just kind of neglectful of him. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, he cut out for a second. Um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, Harry was. Uh, yeah, I thought he was pretty well done. Um, Wait, did I kind did of it, did it pick up the part where I was talking about how he's uh, looking for his father's approval? And yeah, Norman. Yeah, Norman like neglects him. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. And also at the the graduation when. He, he 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 like congratulates Peter, and just kind of he's like, oh, he says directly to Harry, not the first time I've been proven wrong. That's pretty much all Harry gets from him. Yeah, it's it's really sad, honestly. Yeah, that's like another thing High Top mentioned in his video is how uh, at the graduation he just goes right past Harry, goes straight to Peter, and just congratulates him, treats him like a son, and then Harry walks away in the background. Yeah, it sucks, but, you know, uh, and, you know, Harry's trying to, you know, win over Mary Jane with money instead of mm-hmm. really, like, uh, true love. Because, I mean, has he really ever felt that and know what it means? Yeah, he doesn't, so, because, you know, Norman never showed him what love is. 
Yeah, exactly. So he doesn't really know what it is. So mm-hmm. he, he, he hasn't fully developed as a person yet. So he's still kind of very shallow. Yeah. And he's kind of jealous of Peter in a way about how he can never be as good as him in his father's eyes. Yeah. Norman sees him as like the perfect child. And then you, he, you know, you got Norman looking at Harry like a disappointment. Yeah, exactly. So they, they did nothing wrong with Harry in this movie. Yeah, he had a... And then he, of course, ends it with, I'm going to kill Spider-Man. Right. <laughs> the, <laughs> and I, that's just like the comics. So yeah. Me with that. So, uh, so yeah. That okay? So now the last characters we're going to talk about is Uncle Ben and Aunt May. Right. Um, I just want to say that Cliff Robertson will forever be the best Uncle Ben. I don't think, 100%. I don't think anyone will ever come close to what he did. No, he cannot be replaced. I mean, we talked about this earlier, but like the way that he acted uh, in the scene where he's dying. I know. Where he's looking around and the way he says Peter just gets me every time. Like, no matter how many times I watch that scene, I always like at least get chills. Yeah. I cry. It just depends. But man, that scene's so powerful. Yeah, the lighting in that scene, the way it shot, the way Cliff Robertson acts. It's just all perfect, and then, you know, like, the way it transitions into the revenge scene. Yeah, it's It's really good. It's really good. Oh, man. It's like, yeah, it's just perfect, because, you know, when, you know, Uncle Ben has those uh, moments where he's, like, trying to teach Peter a lesson because, you know, he's... Yeah. From all he's learned over life. So, and, of course, he has, like, one of those scenes where he's doing that in the movie, Mm -hmm. Like, yes. And exactly. Cliff Robertson really embodies just the, you know, the loving and caring uh, nature of Uncle Ben. Yes. Like whenever he's at screen, you feel like you're at home. Like, uh, what's his name? Ryan? Uh, Ryan mentioned how Uncle Ben's house and that whole setting, whenever you're around Uncle Ben, it feels like you're at home. And yeah, it does. Like yeah. You're, it's like you're at a grandpa or like a grandparent's house. Yes, exactly. Which I agree with completely. Yeah. It's, uh, they very, they sold the whole, like, Uncle Ben and Aunt May being Peter's parents, basically. Yeah. It was Rupert very well done. Harris, I don't think she can be beaten as Aunt May as of now, with how, which direction they're going in live action. I do not think Rosemary Harris will be beaten. Yeah. I mean, only, there's really only two other adaptations that even come close. PS4, actually, no, you know what? PS4 does beat Rosemary Harris for Ant Man. I agree, yeah. PS4. Yeah, that, um, was like, that was like the best Ant May we'll ever see. Yeah. For, with PS4. And Spectacular Spider Man's up there, of course. Yeah, I mean, Spectacular Spider Man's always going to be in top three with everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> True that. Um,. All right, so now let's talk about just like some criticisms that people have against the movie that don't really make sense to me. Uh, organic webs. Organic webs. <laughs> the, the infamous organic webs. It does not it, matter. It does not matter. Like, it doesn't affect the character because we still see Peter's intelligence. Exactly. Like, you don't need. What, at what point in that movie did you think that Peter wasn't smart? He like, literally studied Norman's nanotechnology and understood it. Like easy. He was telling Peter, uh, he was telling Harry nerdy stuff about a, a telescope, or yeah. you know, he no, at no point in that movie did I doubt Peter's intelligence. I didn't like, need to see him yeah. create a, a little machine for for me to, you know, instantly realize, oh wow, this guy's a genius. Yeah, like, Peter, like, the science award. Did. That's terrific. Like you know. <laughs> It's all over the place that Peter Parker is a, a smart dude in this movie. If you don't show, like, if you don't show Peter's intelligence, and it's not displayed at all, like you have Amazing Spider-Man Two where he doesn't know how to use a battery, then I can see <laughs> why you know the web show, you know the web shooters are necessary. But like, okay, obviously I prefer web shooters. As as a comic fan first, I'll always prefer web shooters. Yeah, of course. But it's just it's, it doesn't really matter. Is yeah, it? it's not a it's not a change that like it's not something that affects the character as at his core. 
Yeah. So, yeah, that's something like, that... Do you like Chips mean, Ahoy or do you like Toll House cookies? It really doesn't matter. It's kind of the same thing. It's just yeah. a preference, really. Yeah, pretty much. You know, it doesn't really matter. So, I, you I, also I, got that, and then you got the suit, how they do the triangle lenses. That doesn't matter. The, the new logos. like It doesn't have to be directly out of the comics. Yeah. I mean, that's just another thing. Like, you know, the costume designer picked this, and that's yeah. what... Like, actually, I mean, the, the triangle lenses are kind of like the uh, McFarlane look. Yeah. From the 90s. Another criticism I see all the time is, like, all of the actors were too old. Uh, oh, yeah. Cool and stuff, like uh, Flash Thompson. I mean, have you... I mean, I just graduated high school. I mean, if you, if you look at high schoolers, some of them look like they're 30. I know. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Like, and also, I don't like, know. If, did I there's no the podcast how Raimi wanted to capture more of the college years, or was that before we started? Yeah, uh, yeah, you did a little bit. Um, so uh, you know, and he doesn't even spend that much time in high school. He's only in high school for like forty minutes, like I said. Yeah, so, like the comics. You know, Flash kind of looks like he could be mid twenties, but there's a bunch of high. Twenty three, and I'm I'm definitely not twenty three. So I have no like my suspension of dis. I don't have this, you know. I yeah. I at no point did I think that it was uh, you know a problem because mm -hmm. I just went through high school and people that look like that. <laughs> and like I said, you know, Raimi okay, so after the later years, and it, you know, he casted Toby because he was a fan of yeah. college. So you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Toby does look a lot younger than he does in the later movies in this one. Yeah, so. also he's more fit. In, in the later movies, he, he kind of loses himself a little bit. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's fine. So let's talk about quips. Um, okay. Well, do you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, he does quip a little bit. Uh, but, you know, he's like, that's a cute outfit, you know, the bone saw. Yeah. That's a good quip. But... What you have to realize about Spider-Man is he only quips when it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And in this movie, he quips when it doesn't matter. Yeah, when like, it matters. The robbers when he's taking pictures. Yeah, he says, cheese. Yeah. He quips. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't do it excessively. And it's but, not like, I mean, yeah, maybe his personality is a little less snarky and, uh, you know, quick-witted yeah. than the comics, but in the end, to me, it doesn't matter as long as you capture the core and what the characters stand for and the messages. And yeah, if you so... if you get if you don't like basically if you don't disgrace the comics, like if you don't go against them, then it's fine to me. So, you know, he does quip. It's not like in your face or anything. Mm -hmm. He does not quip even in the comics and any version of Spider Man. He should I think quip. a lot of people don't realize that in the comics. A lot of the time, we're seeing his his thoughts. You know, yeah, he's normally not talking out loud. It's a lot of thought bubbles that we're watching. That. At. Yeah, uh, you know, every time he's in a life threatening situation or someone's about to die, which is a lot in these movies. Like, yeah, I mean, look at it in the in the, the what's it called, the carnival or wherever they were, um, the festival. Uh, you know, Mary Jane's about to die, <laughs> like she's hanging on the side of a ledge. I wouldn't expect Peter to be quipping there. Exactly. It makes no sense. Uh, and then you get to later on when... Uh, like, also, you get to the part with Jonah. It's not as tense. Like, you know, remember he, like, webs Jonah's mouth when yeah. Green Goblin comes into the office? Yeah, exactly. It's not as tense, like, so, you know, he makes a quip. Let mom and dad talk for a little minute. For a yeah. Little. Yeah, he quips. It's just he doesn't quip when it matters. Yeah, like the... If it matters, ending, so that's what doesn't do it. It's literally a bus of kids and Mary Jane being dropped from a like a skyscraper or like a bridge. Exactly. It's so I wouldn't expect him to be quip. And he's not gonna quip when uh, Green Goblin's beating him to death. Yeah. Okay. So and another thing is, I hear this complaint a lot in general about like 
it's not even necessarily a Raimi movie thing, but like Uncle Ben and Aunt May being old, uh, how it's not realistic. Oh my. Th- nothing bugs me more. Like, I literally live in a family where it could happen, where it will happen. Because what it. you have to have is have uh, siblings be about 20 years apart. My yeah. oldest brother... Just cut out for a little bit. Hello? All right, just cut out for a little bit. Okay, Uh, go ahead and start talking about the climax. Oh, okay. Uh, did you just kind of describe the uh, Uncle Ben and Aunt May thing? Yeah. Okay. So the climax, you know, you've got Norman. He's holding Mary Jane and an entire bus of kids. And he's given Peter the choice to save either Mary Jane or the kids, right? So yeah. he, Peter in this movie, he's got two decisions. He want, He's either going to sacrifice what matters to him for um, the greater good, or he's going to be selfish and kind of get what he wants and not really consider what other people need. So Norman represents, you know, the power hungry, selfish and corrupt uh, kind of pushes the boundaries of morals to, to get what he wants. And then you've got Ben who's selfless and humble and caring. And he represents uh, sacrificing what you want for um, others personal gain. So you're at the bridge scene. He's holding Mary Jane and the bus of kids, and he drops both of them. So you see in Peter's lenses, you've got Mary Jane and the kids being dropped. Um, Peter's a decision. Mary Jane kind of represents going for what you want, and then the kids represent the greater good. So he has to make a choice between those. Uh, he ends up saving both because he's not ready to make the choice. And then we get to the warehouse, and... You know, the whole movie, he's conflicted on what he wants to be. And then we get the part where Norman tells him that he could be like a father to him. And then right there, Peter goes, uh, I have a father. His name is Ben Parker. That's where he makes his decision and wraps up the arc and decides what he wants to be. And he chooses, he has to choose between Ben and Norman, which is like choosing between good and evil. And ultimately, he chooses Ben. So the whole thing is like a metaphor for his art throughout the movie. Yeah, and uh, the final scene with him choosing not what he wants, but what he has to do, his responsibility was just Mm -hmm. perfect, pitch perfect. Like, you know, in the Peter's with Ben in the car, and then Ben goes, these are the years you choose who you're going to be for the rest of your life. So... Obviously, choice is a huge theme in this movie, and that you, bridge scene and the Norman final says, scene. "We are who we choose to be." Now choose. Yeah. So, so Peter, like, Peter right chooses there, yeah. Ben's philosophy, which is great power, great responsibility. And the fact that he saves both initially, he saves Mary Jane and the kids who represent um, selfishness and selflessness. He chooses both. He saves both of them. It just shows how confused Peter is and how he's not ready to make the decision yet. And then yeah. finally, after fighting Norman, going through his trials and coming to that final climax where he has to make the choice, he chooses Ben right there. Yeah. And that completes his arc in the movie. And so, again, it's like he's indecisive on who he is. You know, yes. the movie starts with the opening monolo- monologue of who am I? You sure you want to know? And then he spills it all out. And then mm-hmm. the end of the movie is. He's like, whatever life in store uh, has for me, I'll never forget. With great power comes great responsibility. This is my gift, my curse. Who am I? I'm Spider-Man. So the movie starts with him questioning who he is. Who am I? And the end of it. I'm Spider-Man. Yeah, he's he's made up his mind. He knows who he is now. Yeah, the whole whole movie movie is a rite of passage. Yeah, the whole whole movie is a rite of passage. Him... uh, you know, coming of age, figuring out who he is. Yeah. And uh, it's and so- that's perfect for Spider-Man. That's exactly what Spider-Man is. 
Yeah, exactly. He's, he's deciding. He's trying to choose whether, like, you know, a lot of any kid would choose. If he got powers, he would obviously use those powers to make money. That's probably mm-hmm. what I would do if I got powers. I'd probably use the powers to just make money off it. I would cash in on my talents, right? Yeah. So, of know, course. That's what any kid would do. But Peter Parker, he chooses to use his gifts for the greater good. And it doesn't matter if he loses uh, everything he wants as long as everyone else is benefiting. So that's one reason why I love Peter Parker. Yeah, it's such a great, like, arc. Because he shows us what we could be. Yeah, exactly. I just want to talk about the uh, the final warehouse scene. Okay, uh, yeah. Man, it's so brutal. And it's my favorite fight scene probably in a comic book movie. It's by far my favorite. Like, I've, you know, all these films coming out, nothing ever beats it for me. Every yeah. time I watch it, no other fight gets me as invested. You know, yeah. I'm just adrenaline's pumping. Like, wow, you feel that punch. You feel that punch. Mm-hmm. Oh. And Toby, people like yeah. to, you know, mock Toby Maguire for his grunts and, you know, screams and stuff. <laughs> but those, like, the screams and the grunts in that scene is just completely raw. Exactly. And you really feel Peter's, like, pain. It's I weird, because people, like, they make fun of this sort of thing, but that's what, like, ma- sells it, is that yeah. it's actually raw and real. Yeah, it's, it's like, really... It's like, crying. Like, it's, like, the reason why it looks weird is because he's actually crying. Like, you know, yeah. when you cry, do you, let's put a camera on you and see how you look. You're legit <laughs> the only crying, crying your eyes out. I, like, the only crying scene that, like, is just a little bit that could have been changed probably is the one in Spider-Man three, uh, when Harry's dying and <laughs> the camera's like <laughs> below Peter and you see his double chin and everything. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> to me, that's just selling the emotion, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I understand his style, Raimi's style. He wanted to like really show how down to earth and realistic it is. But like me personally, I just find that one shot laughable. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> so, yeah, the warehouse scene, like I said, it's just probably my favorite fight scene in a comic book movie because it's so real and just raw and no and, uh, no music. The way that uh, Norman gets Peter to go into the warehouse, he has the cable and he like yeah. it around Peter and then he, you know, drags him over there. That's like a direct like visual reference to Amazing Spider-Man 39, which yeah. I love that little detail. I know. Just dragging him on a rope behind him. And he, he throws him like he throws him into the warehouse while he's tied to a rope, chucks a bomb at him into his face, and his whole suit is just completely ripped to shreds. Damage Spidey is the best Spidey. Oh yeah. You know, the damage I love like what like I'm glad Far From Home did a battle damage suit this time around. Yeah, that was great. And like when when the suits get damaged, you feel the weight of the battle, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like Spider Man PS4 with the, the lens ripped out from the advent. Uh, yes. Called, what's it called? The anti ox suit? Anti ox suit, yeah. Yeah. I love how like the lens is ripped out. It looks sick. Yeah, we should talk about the PS4 game some other time, but. Yeah. I mean, that. Do you have any other thoughts? Um, The ending. Uh, How it's just the perfect Spider Man ending. Yeah, it, it ends with. Not what Peter wants or what he needs, mm-hmm. but it's uh, I mean, living up to what he has to be. Let's think about it. Okay, in the comics, every pretty much every issue in the like issue one to about two hundred is just a sad ending for Peter Parker. He never gets what he wants ever. Life is always beating him up. And then in the movie, uh, his best friend's father is dead, and. You know, his best friend blames Peter's alter ego for it, but Peter can't tell Harry that um, that Norman killed himself because he can't disrespect the dying man's wish. <clears throat> Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, he can't disrespect Norman's dying wish. And so he can't tell Harry that it was Norman's own fault initially. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, you know, he's in the graveyard with MJ, and it's the love of his life. It's everything he wanted. But literally his entire life since he was six. 
yes. And he just rejects it. Yeah. So that's like a great, a great closing to his arc. Uh, you know, he's walking away in the graveyard. He talks about um, who he is. He figures out who he is. Uh, and I love how the, the touch, my gift and my curse, because that's definitely um, perfect to describe Spider-Man. Yeah, how... like every, the ending is perfect because it, it takes Peter and Spider-Man and smashes their story arcs into each other. Exactly. The best stories are the ones where Spider-Man's actions directly affect, affect Peter. Peter's. And didn't Vice Brian Intihar or someone say that? I think it was Brian Intihar. Yeah, that was their philosophy for the PS4 game, and I mm-hmm. use that whenever I talk about like Spider-Man, like the course yeah. Spider-Man, like that is. That is absolutely when the best stories happen. Yeah, and because Spider-Man, this was no, uh, yeah. no exception to that. The appeal to Spider Man is like the whole appeal to him is the man part of it. Like, mm-hmm. I'm much more interested in Peter Parker and his struggles and how he deals with his alter ego and his friends and pe- letting people down. I prefer that to, you know, big action sequences. Me too. Even though the action sequences in these movies are pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they're, I mean, because the, they're emotionally driven. Yeah. The action scenes. Like the, like, the whole scene with Green Goblin on the bridge is, like, representative of Peter's arc. It's character-driven. Exactly. So, that's why just, the ending is just perfect. I can't think of a better Spider-Man ending. Because it's, like, right out of a comic. So. Then the final swing is like it still holds oh, up. It holds up for sure with Danny Elfman. All the before. CGI in this movie, except yeah. uh, the only the only scene that kind of aged poorly is uh, it's the scene where he's climbing up the in the after Ben dies, is he going after the killer? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He climbs up the that wall. And, part of Peter's face. Yeah, yeah. If, if, they, if they didn't show the face, it'd be fine. Yeah. They would get away with it, but it is kind of that's the only one where it's like, okay, that's not a real person. Yeah, and I, I like how they did the the swinging scenes. How they used a didn't they use like a a rig for a camera and then record going through the streets and then they inserted Spider Man in with post. Yeah, yeah, they. Did. Yeah, oh, I like how they shot that. Kind of aged poorly was uh, when he's jumping over the roofs when he first. Oh, <laughs> that's they kind of like. Funny. They kind of like Photoshop Toby's face on there. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, other than that, like the CG and all the special effects, they're yeah, really... Yeah, it holds up pretty well. Yeah. Like that final swing, just seeing Peter on the flag, the American flag, and then swinging into the camera. Is yes, just, It's dude. always going to be iconic. I agree. Like that's just, that's just going to... That went down in history, and it's going to be remembered for a long time. So... Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much everything for the movie that I have to talk about. Yeah, me too. So. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for listening. Yeah, uh, we had some time doing this. And uh, also, we'll have uh, Sean on the next one. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll do that soon. And uh, we'll be talking about the second one. Can't wait for that whole trilogy, and then uh, after that, we'll start stimming into other uh, Spider-Man material, like just comics and you know TV shows, the video games, all that stuff. So yeah, we'll get into it all eventually. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, thanks for tuning in. See you guys.